Well, hello, everybody. This is Mark Boyle. I am the Prepper Guy. And uh, recently, I hope you've been enjoying the uh, same shit, different hook uh, videos and podcasts because as, as a, a prepper, um, I look at things differently. I've gotten some heat from my podcasts in the past when I talk about nutrition or it's just about anything because I'm a minimalist and I look at life a little differently. And I look at prepping a lot differently. And so I did my fair share of uh, bashing a few of the, uh, you know, list 100 best things to do, you know, put in your bug out bag and all that happy shit. Um, and I want everyone to know that I'm not doing these uh, podcasts to bash a specific blogger or author or creator. I just like uh, scanning through some of the list because it, it gives me a list. I don't have to write all this fucking shit down. I mean, it's right there. That's the whole point. Same shit. Different list. Different hook. Different title. And so I'd rather just go off of the, the list so you can see that they're, they're all very close to similar, if not the same, in many cases. So... When I talk about a bug out bag, I am not talking about my backpacking bag, which in my case it is. I, I have one bag. It's my backpack. That's it. It's got all my stuff in it because I don't want to have to bug out and then have like six bags to choose from and go, well, this is my inch bag, which is I'm not coming home. And my bug out bag, which means I'm going to bug out. And then I have a, a car bag and a truck bag and a um, just in case bag or a get out of Dodge bag or all these bags. Um, because what's going to happen is all your shit's going to be in five or six locations unless you have multiple items of the same thing that are in all your bags. Well, that might be kind of cool if you, you throw some items in your vehicle. Um, but you, you want to have duplicates then because your one bag, the one bag you can grab should be your all-purpose bag, whether you're going hiking or camping or whether you're bugging out or if you're evacuating. Same items, different mission, different purpose. Now, if you keep stuff in your car, then those will be your basic, basic, very basic things, but they're going to be more car related and automobile related, you know, some tools, some fix a flat, some stuff like that, because if you can get it running, you know, then you're going to go home, you're going to drive. But if you get lost or run off the road or something, then you might want to have some, you know, some power bars, some shit, you know, some water. But, you know, a lot of people keep that in their trunk. Well, if you end up running off the road like one lady that I read about, this was years ago, she slid off the highway and went off an embankment and ran into a tree and she was pinned. She didn't kill her. She had her seatbelt on, but she couldn't get out and open her trunk. So odds are, you know, you're really cool shit when you need it. Um, it's going to be somewhere else. So even if, even if it's in the back seat, you might not be able to get around to get it. So that's why your everyday carry, your EDC, the shit you're wearing and carrying is, is going to have to do it. Now, you know, your your cup holders probably got a water bottle and some coffee or a soda. You, you, you know, hopefully eight. But, you know, if you're leaving work and driving home and this happens, you're going to be hungry. But, you know, this is America. Someone's going to find you. It might be a couple of days. You're not going to die as long as you got some water. So... I look at bugging out from a survivalist point of view. Um, it's not an evacuation. It's not a, oh, let's, you know, let's bug out for a couple weeks for a fucking vacation. To me, the, the word bug out, and I've always had a problem with bugging out because it sounds like retreat. You know, like, ah, run, we're screwed. You know, it, it, it's, I look at it as a fallback plan. You know, I, I need to get away from the chaos, the crap as it flies off the fan and goes everywhere. And, and then, then the plans change after a few days. If I see things calming down, then I, I might go right back home.
but if I see it as total grid down into the world as we knew it, the caca has hit multiple fans and lots of piles of caca has hit the fan, then then you need to get somewhere and you're going to stay there. Well, so there's that three, four day window. And, and when I consider myself bugged out, that means that I probably won't be going home for six, eight months maybe until the lunacy dies down and, and, and things get calm again. You know, they'll never be calm as they were, you know, today or tomorrow, but calmer, you know, the, the biker gangs have all drove by, ran out of gas, got murdered, got killed, whatever, uh, to where I can see some resemblance of going back and a modicum of safety and see what's left to rebuild. Because my bug out location in the community and the tribe or the team I want to rebuild is right here where I live. You know, it's already a community in place. These are people I've known for 20 years. And so I want to come back and help them. And so it's that window in between that you're going to need to survive. And that's where your skills and your mindset and your diet will all come into play. So bugging out, and, and that's, I think, the problem I have with a lot of these lists, like the last one I just did, the 100 items that are essential to every bug out bag. Well, a lot of those items, as we saw, were more of camping, hiking, you know, based on normalcy bias that you're going to get rescued or go back home in a couple days. No, it's it's different. It's a different paradigm. It's a different mindset. Shit has happened. And, and you might not be going back for months, maybe years. Just depends on, you know, what happens where you were going to go back to. If it's a, a pandemic or something, you're not going back to the city for quite a while. Um, if it's an EMP, then you might be able to go back after a while when people realize that the fucking power is not coming back on. You know, they can talk until they're blue in the face about rebuilding the, the, the grid, but they, they can't even keep it working. You know, it's just hanging together with baling wire and bubble gum right now. So to think that, you know, they're going to just turn the lights back on in a month is ridiculous. I mean, there's been times when a, a tree branch falls onto a power line in a storm and it's weeks before they get out there to fix it. So if all the skaters have been blown up and the big, large transformers and have melted, sure, they might have extra parts to fix it. But if, if you study the Carrington event that happened in the 1800s, telegraph lines caught fire. So regardless of, you know, 100 miles away, they, they get the power transformers replaced. It's never getting to your house for quite a while. Sure, they'll get the, the cities up and running, but the, the government or whoever's still around and in charge is going to be uh, kind of, you know, covering their own ass and getting their lights back on so they could, you know, take full control of the people. It's all about control. It's not about your health and safety. They care less. It would just be a reason for them to say, hey, look, everything's screwed up. Let's go in there and enact martial law or some kind of maneuver to where we can control all the plebes now. So you might not be able to go back for a long time. So, you know, bugging out means to me, in my opinion, that things have gotten to a point to where you might not be able to come back for weeks, if not months, and depending on the event, maybe never, you know, just, you might just have to go wherever you go and, and, and rebuild your life somewhere else, you know, if it's a, a pandemic or something where everyone's just dead in your community or whatever happens, you know, even, even an economic collapse um, will be so severe in America and therefore worldwide that um, there's no putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. You know, so there will be panic. There'll be entitled people thinking that, hey, where's my EBT check? You know, they didn't put money back in my card. They're going to get mad. They're going to burn shit. They're going to, you know, look what happened in Baltimore. And that was their own neighborhood for something that didn't really affect them. Like, you know, their EBT card not having money in it. it was that serious then. So when I talk about bug out, I'm talking about the end of the world as we knew it. And, and many things can trigger that into the world or that Tiawaki. 
Um, so when you grab that bag, you don't want, you know, stupid shit in it. You want mostly as much food and water and filters and stuff that you can take. And, and then, you know, then some clothes and stuff, but you're going to, you know, you're going to have to build a shelter and lay low. So that's why I rip a lot of these apart. And, and yes, prepping is, is about preparing for life events. So that's different. See, that's being prepared for, you know, breaking your arm and you can't work for a week and you can get a month and you, you need some money in, in the bank to pay your bills and some food and, you know, just systems in place that will get you through that rough spot. But many preppers, I would say the majority, are prepping for a Tiawaki or shit hit the fan kind of event to where what was normal yesterday is not going to be normal tomorrow. And therefore, your preps have to reflect more of a long-term thing. Because if you have insurance and and stuff like that, if you got to evacuate, like I said, get in your car or truck and go to a hotel and hang out for a week, call it a vacation. And, and, and hopefully when you come home, the tornado didn't haul your mobile home down the road or rip the roof off your house or, you know, do damage that, you know, then you'd want to be prepared for. But, you know, look at it this way. If you're one of them preppers that all of your shit is at your home, and a, and a tornado comes and takes your house and erases it. Uh, where are your preps? Well, all your beans, band-aids, and bullets are spread across the county. So that is the severe kind of prepping you want to prep for. Now, if you live in Tornado Alley, I'm sure you have a cellar or something underground. That's where it makes sense to have, you know, a not a bunker type thing, but an underground place where your stuff is. But most of the storm cellars and stuff were, you know, pretty small. It was really to hunker down until the tornado passed and it's over. You come right back out and hopefully your house is still there. And then you, you know, go to your neighbors and help him. And then hopefully everybody's got some food and you can survive. So it's different. It's a different mindset. You know, that is temporary might have destroyed your whole world, but it's still temporary. The tornado blew by, it erased your neighborhood, sucks. And now it's it's over. Tornado season's over. Yeah, okay. But when it's not temporary, when it's permanent, when it's a end of the world event, a, a, a life altering thing that changes life on earth, maybe, or for sure in your country, your state, because even if it's a localized event, it's not permanent. It's temporary. If it's your state, it's still temporary because you know every, everybody comes together to help. If it's the nation's power grid, then we have other you know fish to fry because we're on our knees and, and our enemies might not be. So they can come rolling up in here and start causing problems too. So that's where prepping for other things like that are, are more important, you know, to be tactically trained and all that. But if you're not that person, like I said, I don't carry around a trauma kit because I'm not trained for that. I'm, I'm not going to have, you know, battle rifles and all that because I'm not trained for that. So I just need to keep what's important to me alive. And that's my wife and, and my kids or whoever's around that I bug out with that, you know, wanted to come with. So don't take it wrong when I make light or bash on these lists because my frame of reference is when I'm talking about bugging out at Tiawaki and SHTF, I'm talking about shit hitting the fan, causing a end of the world event as we knew it. No happy face, no upside. You leave, you might never come back. So your your bag should be your bag. You don't want all this other stuff because you might not have time to take inventory of all your bags and then go, I need this, I need that, you know, so pack a good bag. If, if you like to hike and, and camp, have that be your same bag. This is my advice. I'm not Bear Grylls. I'm not Dave Canterbury, you know, but they're, they're coming at it differently. But even Dave Canterbury with all of his thousands of videos talks about things that would be useful as bushcraft, you know, how to build a forge, how to move it, you know, things with iron and stuff. All that has to do with 
if your retreat survives. And the bigger your retreat, the bigger the target. So then that requires security, requires more people, requires more food, requires more land. And now you're a bigger target, so now it requires other things. And, and it's just a lot of logistics I'm personally not into. You may be. But when you bug out that initial, you know, lights come on, cockroaches scatter. When you bug out, you want to have the right stuff. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that's on some of these blogs that talks about urban survival and hunkering down, which makes no sense. But let's take a look and see. But I wanted to put that, that out there because I didn't in the, in the first one where I ripped on the, the 100 items. And uh, so that's where I'm coming from. If the, this doesn't rock your world or you look at it totally different, then by all means, the, the, the next part of this uh, video and podcast will be on tearing apart some more shit. So we'll be right back. Hey, now, I'm back. I just wanted to remind everyone to please remember to subscribe if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening to it on uh, Podbean, prepperguy.podbean.com. Um, subscribe, you know, hit the notification on YouTube, uh, leave some comments. That's always nice so we can have a dialogue and stuff. But uh, most importantly, just thanks for being here right now. That is good enough for me, but thank you. So one I wanted to look at it was 10 tips, another 10, for prepping if, if you happen to live in an apartment. So that would be the hook, you know, 10 things for people that want to, you know, are preppers in, in an apartment, which, you know, for years I lived in an apartment and, and stuff, but I, I had the same, same old philosophy. It's like uh, as soon as the writing on the wall tells me to get the shit out of here, I'm gone, you know, and I grab that one bag and I leave. Um, so, you know, it's, it says the closer you are to the city, then, then you really need to bug out, which is, yeah, duh. You know, because cities are just hell holes. And there was a really good article on shithitthefanplan.com, I think is what it is, from a guy that, you know, and, and it's been all around the internet, the guy that survived Bosnia when it was kind of like under siege and stuff, and it was just a fucking war, and how dangerous it was to just even go outside. And, you know, he said if he had had a lighter, a bunch of lighters, he could have been a rich man because everyone needed a lighter and stuff. So there are times when you could get trapped. And, and that probably my biggest tip would be um, pay attention because you don't want to get trapped in a, in a situation where you just cannot retreat. And so the biggest tip for all preppers that even live near a city or in an apartment or a suburb is really just pay attention. That's the most important tip because if you see things starting to go sideways, don't stick around fucking leave so that one you know number one that makes sense you know but then it says stockpile freeze-dried dehydrated food because it takes up less space well duh but it's that food thing we were talking about it's like you know you could have some mres under your mattress or something like that <clears throat> and that's pretty good but if you have a lot of uh freeze-dried food and wise food in the buckets and stuff and you're paying attention, and it's time to leave, are you going to have time to leave and haul all that shit with you? So now, because your preps are at your location, your apartment, and you weren't paying attention, now you're stuck because that's where your shit's at. So then you might as well have a lot of it. You might as well have a couple months supply. Because you're not going to be able to leave. It might be too damn dangerous. Maybe after a month, the crazies will all die off or leave, you know, looking for richer territory. And, and you better hope that they don't find your apartment, kick the door down, and just kill you. It says, consider over-penetration when choosing a firearm. Now, this is something that I used to do when, when I had younger kids living at home. Because there's times I'll wake up with the night terror. And if my gun is really handy, I might shoot that shadow on the wall going right through the wall and hurting one of my children. So over penetration was always like, you know, back in the day I had exploding tip ammo, which I don't think you can buy now, 
but uh, that way it would disintegrate within the wall and it, and it couldn't go through and maybe hurt my neighbor or one of my children. And uh, so I always, you know, when I couldn't, when I found out it was really kind of considered cruel and unusual to use um, exploding ammunition, um, I switched to shotgun with just birdshot. And, and at, uh, you know, across your room or something, birdshot's going to saw someone in half. So you don't have to worry about it hurting your neighbor or your children, uh, even if it hits a window. Most handguns or you know, ammunition, like from a rifle, would go right through that window and a quarter mile down the road and maybe hurt somebody or you know, even just you know, a couple hundred yards. And you've accidentally hurt somebody, and now you're in trouble. So shotguns are awesome, and they're great for close range. So that, that was a good tip. I like that one. Uh, know where your water heater is. Yeah, because uh, there's water in there. Your toilet tank, not the bowl. The tank has you know two, three gallons of water in there. Um, get one of those uh, bobs, I guess it's called. for. It's like a bladder that you put in your bathtub and you fill up with water and it's sealed. So you have clean water in there so you can flush your toilet and whatever. Because the water is not going to stay on long, you know, if the power's out. Because all the water in cities is usually pumped somewhere into a tank way up high to where it flows down, runs through filters that take a lot of pressure. Um, so don't count on the water. So just to get a large, larger than average first aid kit, which I, I guess if you're you're trapped in your apartment, that might come in handy for neighbors that know how to use it. I'm not a, a medic, but even just like extra band-aids, extra gauze, quick clot, all that stuff. That doesn't take a rocket scientist to use that shit. So it's, you know, like if you got a box of 100 Band-Aids, get three. You know, get some of the tape and stuff like that. So that that makes sense. And then it says the, the best thing would be to get extra uh, place for storage, like like a garage. Like if your apartment has a garage and stuff, um, you can store more stuff in there. Once again, then now you have more stuff, so you're going to have more reason to hesitate and it's going to stop you from bugging out when you should have. Now, it says also that you could get a storage locker maybe within walking d distance or something from your apartment or driving distance, which might help you go, holy shit, let's go get our crap. And then since you're already on the road, well, fuck, let's just bug out. So that might be a good way to, to pull you off center and, and get over to where your preps are at a, at a storage unit more toward out of town and then once you're there you're going to look back and go holy shit the town's already on fire i'm not going back there let's go that way and and, and if you if you put it off too long just getting there might wake you up to the fact that you're not going back so that's that's good you know uh, if you had it in the apartment complex at a, in a garage then uh, you're you're only you know 100 feet removed from your apartment so if anything happens there, all your shit's still trapped with you. So I'm not a proponent of having large amounts of preps right here. It says get creative with storage. You know, under your bed is a good place. And there's there's a lot of places you can hide guns and stuff and trick drawers and shelves. It's just, yeah, regardless if you're bugging out or not, that's just totally commonsensical. You know, because you don't want people breaking into your house or your apartment when you're gone and, and just going, oh, look, here's a gun, here's a gun. Let's just take all this shit, go commit a crime, and he'll get in trouble. So you do want to lock it up and hide it. So that makes sense whether you're bugging out or not or if you're a prepper in an apartment or a house. And then the last thing is it says try to find a place to mount antennas for your communications. Well, we went over comms. Now, for prepping, comms is great. Uh, we all got cell phones nowadays. If the world's not falling apart, just fucking call your friend. Um, you know, I'm not a ham radio kind of guy. Uh, it's highly traceable. You know, if things really get bad where they can triangulate and military or bad military or even bad people can triangulate if they got, you know, two or three brain cells left from high school, they can figure it out. You know, just doesn't take a lot to triangulate if you have a little bit of different equipment and stuff. So. I, I wouldn't have antennas. I just, just use my cell phone, and when shit gets really bad, I'm gone. So that was, uh, you know, for 
you know, apartment dwellers, um, urban heights, townhouses, it's all kind of the same, you know, and, and, and then there was, uh, it's uh, survival tips from homeless people. So you think, well, that's a, a wealth of information there because, you know, they're, they're surviving on the streets. So what the hell? Well, dress in layers, that's pretty much common sense. You bug out if you're in the forest or camping, hiking, walking off. You dress in layers, you know. Homeless people have figured out how to do it a little better. <clears throat> Use newspaper for insulation. Well, that's uh, really just common sense. Also, it's not really for urban dwellers. But I guess there's more newspaper laying around if you're in the city. But once again, I'm I'm leaving. It's up to you. Uh, use water bottles. Sleep near other homeless people. So sleeping next to other homeless people or people. Um, you got to remember this all comes from a, a paradigm or a, a bias that they're homeless. These people that I'm reading this about are, you know, based on survival, of, you know, from homeless people. Well, they're safer homeless today than they, they or you will be once the shit has hit the fan. Because you got to remember rule of law and all that just fucking went out the window so uh, being with people is is an okay idea if you're homeless if the world is ended then the gloves are off all the rules are changed so i and and then one of the you know pack wisely you know be ready to leave don't fight anyone consider a dog well if you're fucking homeless i don't know how you can afford a dog Carry first aid supplies, use baking soda, you know, which is for brushing your teeth and a lot of things, especially like if you get battery acid on you or something, if you're doing a thing, uh, you have to pour baking soda on it or the acid will just eat all the way through you. So battery acid, soda pop, that'll neutralize that acid. Don't eat just anything. So there's a few articles in here. And, and I had just selected one blog that had a lot of articles on um, urban survival. You know. um, if you're a prepper, all of them make complete and total sense right up until it's time to leave. And I think that's my big takeaway on this is what happens to a prepper that may have to bug out but like we discussed in, you know, I think the first part one is what happens if you have to hesitate because so much of your stuff is in one central location. Well, then you're, you're, you're preparing to fail because you're not going to be able to leave and you may not be able to load years of prepping supplies and gear. I mean, think about when you, when you move you know, get out of college or whatever, and you have a, your first apartment. It's a one bedroom, might even be a studio apartment. And you move in and you got a few things in your parents' trunk and you're like, yay. And then six months later, when you move, you have to rent a U-Haul because you've accumulated shit. Now, a lot of that's bulky shit like furniture and crap that you're not going to take when you bug out. But think about your preps over a one-year, five-year, 10-year period of being in your house. You don't just have some food in your pantry. You have a basement full of canned goods, dehydrated food. You know, just if you have one, just take inventory and look at it and go, this would require a semi-trailer, guns, you know. I'm a minimalist and I have, you know, seven, eight rifles and stuff. So if I have to bug out, a lot of that's going to have to be left. Now, I have that cut and run attitude. But a lot of people go, I, I, I can't leave all that. Well, then you can't leave all that. I can't leave all that food. Well, then you can't leave all that. So then bugging out becomes irrelevant because you will never be able to bug out because you have to hunker down. And and we discussed that. You need to be able to to, to just cut that what binds you and bug out or you're going to end up 
being in a bad situation. Now, that's not saying that all collapses that that affect America, whether it's an EMP and all that, are going to require that you cut and run. But that would only be if you live in a small rural town, 70, 80 miles away from a big city. Then you might have some time to make a few trips. But if you're trying to get out of a, if you're in the suburbs and you're going to have to get on a roadway or some way, if it's, if it's a good enough road for you to take a big truck on that's got a trailer with all your shit in it, then you're going to be on decent roads and those roads are going to become congested and cluttered. And you might not be able to take all your stuff and leave. So consider how much stuff, if you're just new into prepping, how much stuff are you going to have next year? Because you know, we're always buying shit. I mean, that's the fuck we do. Whether you're a prepper or you're into scrapbooking. I know people that scrapbook. They have crates full of crap. It would take a small pickup truck just to haul all their, what they call it, scrapbooking shit. You know, got two or three crates of just crap that, you know, for painting this and doing that and sticking vinyl on here and got, you know, a heat press and a printer and a cutter and computer to run it and, you know, all the vinyl. And so that's just a, a silly little hobby that your life does not depend on. If you're a prepper that believes in stockpiling beans, band-aids and bullets, it's going to take five or six truckloads. So I guess my point is, think about that. Are you gonna are you gonna anchor yourself to where you live right now because of your preps? And if that's the case, because you're handicapped or you just can't get it through your head that you're gonna have to buck and bug out, you're staying. This is the hill I'm dying on. Then it will probably be the hill you die on. But then you need to look at your pile, look at the position you put yourself in, and then come up with a plan to protect it and maybe until it dwindles down enough to where you can leave it. So you're going to have to have a lot more training for tactical things. You're going to have to be really good at noise discipline, light discipline, cooking without heat, like cold camping in your apartment because you fire up your stove and all of a sudden um, there's smell wafting through the apartment complex. And you know down at the end of the hall where the, the smoke and the smell is, wafting across into crackhead Bob drug dealer's apartment that's been starving for that same week, all of a sudden this is, you know, I mean, which neighbor is barbecuing this weekend that you'll smell it and go, oh, smells like he's having ribs. He must have a Traeger smoker. And you can almost point to him. It's like, seems like it's coming from over there. Because, I mean, you know, we're not animals, but we're not stupid. So how are you going to cook this food? So you're going to be eating cold meals, MREs, all that, and you, you know, you can't cook with propane in a closed up an apartment. But the minute. <laughs> Guard dog is on duty. Good point. Do you have a pet? Are they going to be making noise? People are going to know where you are, whether you live in a neighborhood or a townhouse complex. So I'm going to look for a, one more article and then I'll wrap this all up. All right, well, one of the other lists here that I see is uh, 100 Best Survival Foods at the grocery store. Now, I would imagine um, there's a lot of really good uh, you know, stuff you can buy at, at, a, at a grocery store. Of course, they're going to have a lot of stuff that I, I would not recommend you store or eat, but that's uh, my personal opinion. I'm not a doctor or nutritionist, so I can't advise but i am a prepper and i have read uh, parts of lineager's biochemistry 101 which is a college uh, textbook for students that are studying biochemistry i don't read the whole book on biochemistry because you know i don't need to know how my my fingernail grows i, I just need to know the the pathways and the enzymes that process food and then i've read the book by uh, Gregory Ellis, he's a research uh, scientist, pretty good on nutrition. He's, uh, he's got a 
master's or a PhD in biochemistry and a, a doctorate in uh, nutrition. So with that, and then having watched probably about three, four hundred hours of videos from really good, you know, doctors that are into keto and paleo. And, and it's not that I'm just watching their videos because they agree with me or vice versa. It's just when you really filter through all the bullshit, um, you have to look at it as, well, how did the how did the caveman survive? How did the Paleolithic man survive? How did we as a species survive before we became agricultural based and started growing grains? Well, that would have been eight, nine thousand years ago, and we you know, so we existed as a species way before we became agricultural and started eating grains. So the human animal was designed to eat meat. That's the enzymes are designed to process meat and, and fat. That's just the way we are. And, and, and you can see the, the flaw in the medical community's logic of saying fat is bad for you and carbs are good for you because we have uh, epidemics of obesity and um, diabetes, children with type 2 diabetes now that was unheard of 500 years ago, even 70, 80 years ago you know, to an epidemic proportion. I mean, people got diabetes a long time ago. But in 1860s, they knew that carbs caused fat, and, and it was bad for people. So for almost 100 years, the low-carb diet was the diet to lose weight and to be healthy. And then in, in the 60s, 1960s, when they started going into fat bad, if you're not going to be eating fat to get your calories, then well, then you got to eat carbs. So they've known this, and we're not hearing it. Let's just take a look at their their list of canned food, just for shits and giggles. So best canned foods to add to your stockpile: apples. See, that's a carbohydrate, it's full of sugar. Uh, it's in a can, so it's processed. So instead of you know being out hiking or surviving or a caveman, and you find an apple, you might eat one apple. Well, you might even eat two. But if you have a, a cup of apple sauce, that's like six or seven apples. You would never eat that naturally. And they're loaded with, you know, just sugar. Fructose is really bad for you. The same as sugar is really bad for you. Now, bacon, I agree with. You get canned bacon all day long. Um, and that's something I'm, I would like to throw in my bug out bag would be, you know, some canned bacon. It, but it's a can and it's bulky. And I'm not sure how many calories you would get out of a can of bacon as opposed to something other that's more calorie dense and, and high fat dense. But not too much has got as much fat, good fat, which is saturated fat, um, than bacon. That, that shit just rocks. Pinto beans, no. I, I, I don't like beans and, and they're, they got, you know, fiber in them, which just causes inflammation beyond all recognition. If you have inflammation problems, stop eating fiber for a week and, and just see if it makes you feel better. You know, it, it's just what I did. And within four or five days, all my joint pain went away and I haven't had joint pain for about four years. And, and I used to have really bad joint pain and inflammation. I'm 65. So it worked for me. Beef stew. Now, I like the beef stew. It's got a lot of uh, other things in it that, you know, I can pick around. I just want the meat. So I would be happier buying uh, canned meat. But, hey, beef stew is good. Now, all these things, as, as I rattle them off, um, you're going to see that um, you're adding a lot of mass to your pantry. And if you have to bug out, you're only going to be able to grab two or three days' worth, and the rest of it's going to have to be left. So, you know. We're talking about bugging out. Now, if you're prepping, that's that's fine. Having a beef stew and bacon, canned bacon. But then if, if the world hasn't ended, then I guess you could cook some bacon. But as a prepper, I would think you're storing bacon for in case something happens. And, and so, therefore, the worst thing that could happen is you'd have to bug out and leave all your shit. But let's just say the power goes out for three or four days and you can't get to the store because of whatever or you you get hurt, you can't work, then having these foods that you normally eat 
in excess would be a good thing. So I'm not saying as a prepper, you know, I have extra stuff that I eat all the time. <clears throat> you know, I'll cook four or five pounds of bacon, you know, once a week, you know, just for, for the week. So, you know, it's something I eat. So if I couldn't cook because I was hurt or couldn't work or the banks quit working because something, I, I would have the foods I need. And that is a very smart part of prepping. But when you're talking about bugging out, then remember, I guess is my point, that you're going to have to leave a lot of this stuff. So try not to count on this for bug out. Canned chicken, awesome. Oh, oh yeah, it said something about bread. And and you can get canned bread, you know, but I, I don't eat bread, so. But I do eat meat. Chili, once again, it's got beans, fiber. Sometimes it's got a lot of carbs in it. Uh, the, the hamburger meat's good in there. Corn is a, is a carb. It's, you know, corn syrup, corn sweeteners. Yeah, comes from corn. That's how they make whiskey. So there's a lot of sugar in it. I, I wouldn't want to have to stockpile and count on eating a bunch of corn. Uh, and I'm not one of them preppers that, you know, when when I went on a keto diet and a low-fat or low-carb, high-fat diet, I didn't have children, but a lot of my friends that are on that diet, also they do have children, and they're like, "Well, it's really hard to have, you know, stuff in the in the cabinets that the kids will eat." I go, "Well, if if you believe in this diet, then your kids should eat it. So don't buy cereal and shit. Teach them how to eat diced tomatoes, green beans, pie filling. Are you gonna bake a cake when you're?" fucking world ends i doubt it soup can be good you know but the, now the problem i have is soup nowadays you know because they used to just say soup is good food well now they're all fat free so broth would be really good for you you could live on broth but not the stuff they put in there and then remember that it's it's full of some vegetables and things whatever sugars and stuff that you should not be eating so you could uh you could strip this list down to the meats, canned chicken, canned beef, um, canned bacon. Those would be all foods that you could eat. Spam, I love spam. Don't even get me started on that. That stuff is just, it used to be a lot better when I was younger and a kid because it just had a different recipe. Canned tuna. If you can find canned tuna that's packed or canned in, in oil, Oh, well, shit, there's your fish oil right there. Um, now, I don't know if they use the fish oil in the tuna to make the pills for fish oil, you know, an omega-3, and then just put fucking Crisco in there. I don't know. So I, I would I would check with it because if it's, if it's canned in oil and it's fish oil, you're pretty well golden there. Uh, vegetable melody. Yeah. You know, I, I just, I'm... I'm an asshole. I'm sorry. But I just see this as as a bad idea. Now, here's 10 ways to preserve meat without a fridge or freezer. Now, I'm a meat eater. And, and so I'm not going to read that because I'm going to agree with it 100%. You know, learn how to make jerky, learn how to smoke, learn how to cure, how to salt, how to do all anything to do with preserving meat. Learn how to do it. Because um, even if you have to bug out and you shoot a larger than expected animal and you don't have power you're going to want to know that skill so those are skills foods that can store a hundred years yeah well, honey which is really bad for you it's good for medicine um and it's really good for burns because it it doesn't let oxygen through it that's why you shouldn't feed babies honey because it it screws up their oxygen intake, basically, on, on a fucking molecular level almost. If I could only stockpile these foods. So let's let's look at that. And then I'll, I'll quit bitching and be a little fucking asshole. Well, I can already see none of this shit as food I'm going to eat. Beans, we talked about that. Blueberries, sugar, fructose. And people go, well, yeah, but you can make jelly and jam. It's like, well, 
if I don't eat sugar and fruit, then I'm not going to eat jelly or jam because I would like to put it on my bread, which I also don't eat. So this is all coming from my point of view. And, and if you want to learn about the keto diet, um, there's, there's really good videos on prepperguy.com under, uh, you know, nutrition and health by a couple doctors that are fucking doctors. The one doctor I would like to share all of his videos is uh, Dr. Ken Berry, but my importer won't bring in his videos. I don't, I don't know if he's got it locked down or what. I mean, you can share them all day long, but you can't import it. I haven't learned how to do that yet. Broccoli, carrots, because it's got beta carotene. So let's, you know, let's consider the reasons for why this person would want to store broccoli and carrots. And if you remember in one of the things uh, where it said multivitamins, and I said it's a scam, um, broccoli is high in uh, vitamin uh, B vitamins, uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, potassium. So potassium is more of a, a nutrient which you can get from other things. And then carrots are chocked full of beta carotene and then other vitamins as well. <clears throat> well, let's look at this from a, a biochemical point of view. When you eat cellulose-based food, which is plant-based food, broccoli, carrots, the, the cell structure is cellulose. So all the yummy vitamins inside of that are locked in by cellulose. So kind of like you have a gun safe and there's, yes, there's guns and ammo in that safe. But if I don't have the combination, I can't get to it. So it does me no good. As humans, we do not have the enzyme to break down cellulose and, and the body will never create it. That's how unnatural it is. So if, if you couldn't run to GNC and buy that enzyme because you wanted to be a vegetarian, then you wouldn't be able to eat it. Now, if you lived five, 600 years ago, you couldn't go to GNC at all. So we as a human species existed 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 1,000, 10,000 years ago. And we didn't eat those kind of foods because they really didn't really exist, except maybe if you lived in that area where broccoli grew wild uh, and a lot of the plants that we eat are hybrids they're created from farming techniques so they didn't exist but let's say it did and, and you ate a carrot you're not going to get the beta carotene out of it because you don't have the enzyme to break it down and yet without beta carotene we survived so it leads me to wonder do we really need all those vitamins from A to zinc? Because 90% of them are plant derivatives, plants that you could never eat naturally without taking some man-made enzyme to break it down. So it just stands to reason and logic that if you were to eat that 500 years ago or 10,000 years ago, if it even existed, and you ate it, it would go right through you and you wouldn't get those vitamins out of it. So therefore, we must not need them. And there's a, there's a whole book written by Dr. Gregory Ellis on the, the vitamin hoax that you can read. It was really enter, entertaining and thought-provoking. So I'm going to leave that out. Cereal, which is grains, no. It's just, just no. Chicken, so we're back to that. Um, mixed nuts. I like nuts. Nuts are good for you. Um, we got a lot of fiber, so I have to watch eating them because of the joint pain and the inflammation. But uh, I like nuts, so that's a yes. Potatoes, no way in hell. Uh, a baked potato has anywhere from a quarter to a half a cup of sugar per baked potato. So people that eat potatoes and then wonder why their blood sugar levels are all fucked up, uh, that's why. Powdered milk. Now, see, be it paleo, I understand that milk has carbs in it. I'm not worried about drinking it for all the other reasons, they say, because milk has become more of a food product than an actual nursing baby formula. And if it didn't have carbs in it, then I would drink milk. 
more than I do now, but I, I put heavy whipping cream in my coffee. Uh, probably in a day of five or six cups of coffee, I probably get 500 calories uh, just from the heavy whipping cream. Um, oranges, more sugar, right? So, so, you know, a lot of these things, if you look at it, let's just fucking do that. Oranges, sugar, very bad for diabetics or becoming diabetic. Powdered milk, um, really it's powdered milk. What's the, the fucking point? Drink water, but it's probably got carbs in it. So there's that. Potatoes, carbs. And then on this side, we got nuts, chicken. So there's two. Cereal, no. Carrots, no. Broccoli, no. Blueberries, no. Beans, no. So we have eight things that would be detrimental to your health if you study it, and two things that would be good for you. So I would say if I was making a list of uh, 10 foods that I was going to stockpile, it would be, well, I could break it up, canned tuna, canned beef, canned bacon, canned chicken, yeah, canned meat, um, nuts, and then I have canned coffee beans. Because I'm telling you right now, if I can't have coffee when the world ends, I'm going to kill some motherfuckers out there and find their coffee. Because I love my coffee. I'll be hating life because they can't put um, heavy whipping cream in it unless I go find a cow, which I might do. And then how to dehydrate food. Well, once again, you're just bulking up in your pantry. Um, and you're going to have too much stuff that you can't move. How five dollars a week can uh, get your family three hundred and ninety-seven pounds of food. Now I'm looking at the picture. I'm not going to read it, but it's cereal, crackers, uh, pie filling. Well, it's it's pretty much the picture is all carbs. Because see, carbs are cheap. That's why the FDA created the pyramid was um, because it's cheaper to feed people grains than meats. And we were at war when they came up with that. So we were rationing gas and people were giving up uh, you know, their metals so they could make bullets for the war effort and all that. So that's you know, why they came up with it. But now we're, we're not at war. We don't um, ration food. We don't you know, ration gas. So uh, just eat meat. So now there's some survival foods. Cattails, which I've always known cattails are edible from top to bottom. It's fiber and carbohydrate, but in a pinch, if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're starting to see dead people because you're so delirious, then mow down on a cattail. I have no problem with that kind of shit. You just don't want to get in that position because you, it, it's almost like putting yourself in a position to where you have to borrow money from the mob. It's not going to turn out well. So, uh, you know, how to make ration bars. Well, I've, I've read those things and they're just really, um, just a high carbohydrate. So I'm going to um, stop on that. We covered, you know, urban survival a little bit and and foods, basically nutrition. Like I said, I'm not a doctor. I can't tell you how to eat. And I'm really not going to waste my time with it. I know why I eat the way I eat because tons of research. And I will recommend a movie on Amazon Prime called The Perfect Human Diet. And it's very good. They go back two million years to prove that we are designed to eat meat. And, and you have to, just like any subject, you have to break away from the dogma and actually question what it is that our, our parents and parents, parents and parents, parents and parents, parents have been taught that taught us. And if you think back that, you know, people go, well, the founding fathers ate bread. Yes, but we became agricultural based 8,000 years ago. They weren't even writing shit down hardly back then. So you can't look back at a 100 year or 200 year history and go, well, if it, you know, that's history. They ate bread. You have to go back, you know, 20, 30,000 years and go, as a, biochemical treatment plant, what did it run on through all of those years that 
kept our species alive to today. And if it was worked in this period of time, then it should work in this last period of time. This is the bullshit. But as a, as a species, as a human animal, as whatever you want to call us, the engine has always ran on premium unleaded. And just because they've come out with E85 in this last little, so there's like a million years and then there's like this little bit, does it mean that we can't go back to premium unleaded? Will your car or your body run on E85? Sure. That's the way it was created. But if you look at the, the all of the heart disease and the health problems and the, the rapid diabetes and obesity and Alzheimer's and all these things are linked to carbohydrate-based foods. Cancer is now linked to glucose in the body because the cancer cells eat the shit out of that. So there's not too many things you can't look at that afflict us as humans that hasn't been created and caused by eating carbs. And the ailments are the effect of that poor diet. So I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to say do your research because as a meat eater, I find prepping 10 times easier. And also, I have a lot more energy. I take no medication, which is a big prepping consideration. I don't need to go to a doctor once a week or once a month or once a year, which would be another consideration if you're prepping for long-term survival. My blood work is fine. Everything is fine. So you can look at prepper A, me, who's a meat eater, a high-fat diet eating machine, and another prepper that eats carbs and buys into the myth of carbs and plant-based food and go, if you had to bug out, would you want to have to take a year's supply of insulin, medicine, heart medicine, um, cholesterol, low in statins, or would you rather just bug out and be healthy? So there's a correlation between nutrition and diet and being prepared for survival long term. And and like I say, all I can do is is throw in my two cents here. I hope th this has helped you. And I, I think I'm just going to wrap up the series because I've I've hammered on nutrition enough to where there's no reason to to say other than if you're into four wheel driving and you happen to have a Jeep you will find 10,000 videos to one good one about working on your Jeep. 10,000 shit articles on how to clean your gun as opposed to one common sense way that works best every time. And these are all hooks. They're designed to grab your attention and to sell you something or to monetize their video. And, and yes, do you have to watch a lot of them to find the nugget of truth? Yeah, you do. And so that's why I thought, I'll just go through this for you. and then narrow it down to a few nuggets of truth. And if you want to take my advice, awesome. If not, that's awesome. So remember, click subscribe, like, bell notifications, bell that shit. Go to uh, prepperguy.podbeam.com for all my podcasts, uh, YouTube channel, obviously. You're probably watching it here um, for Prepper Guy. And then prepperguy.com for all of uh, the ravings of a madman. So I hope you liked it. Talk to y'all later. Enjoy the apocalypse. Love y'all. Bye-bye. For all we ought to have thought and have not thought, all we ought to have said have not said, all we ought to have done and have not done. I pray thee, God, for forgiveness.